ensuring the land base is available for farmers is a critical part of what we need to do. More and more people are wanting to know where their food comes from. So when we meet with them, we just have to tell our story. We need the investment in the land, we need investment in the infrastructure, and then everything else is going to happen. It will fall into place. Welcome to Metro Vancouver's program, The Sustainable Region. I'm Vanessa Timmer. Our show looks at the matrix of systems that supports Metro Vancouver's 2.3 million residents. Today we're going behind the grocery aisle into Metro Vancouver's local food system to understand its people, policies and pressures. The market is where most people interact with the food chain, but the system starts much further back. Back to the land, you could say. With abundant mountains and forests, only 5% of British Columbia is arable land, and much of that is close to home. Over 60% of BC's farm sales are from the Fraser Valley and Metro Vancouver area. Most of those farms are small. The average farm size in the southwest of the province is 20 hectares. Compare that to the national average of over 720 hectares. It's a desirable place to be, and the land values attest to that. Our first story takes a closer look at that land to examine why it is farmed or isn't. This woman isn't the neighborhood snoop. She's at work on a joint project for the BC Ministry of Agriculture and Metro Vancouver. We'll start with property number 99. Okay. Uh, Polygon Zero is mature cranberries with salt. These two are noting the crop on this South Burnaby land. It's part of a project that inventories the uses of agricultural land in Metro Vancouver. We have individual parcels identified on the maps. We have binoculars, we literally drive up to every parcel, we scan the property, we're looking for different types of agricultural uses, whether it's crops, livestock, or some type of agricultural building. So we can say this, that's vegetables again? The data collection is detailed, with categories such as building type, ground cover, and irrigation format. Metro Vancouver is interested in the data because they're collaborating on a strategy to improve the food system in the Lower Mainland. The first goal in the Regional Food System Strategy is increased capacity to produce food closer to home. This is where the protecting the land, ensuring the land base is available uh, for farmers is a critical part of what we need to do for the future. And uh, then we're going to work our way back down. We need a better understanding of what is happening on the agricultural land, how much land is actively farmed, if it's not being farmed, what is it being used for, will it ever be farmed, can it be farmed. The goal is to go through for each local government and print a report that will provide standardized information in terms of area of crops, different types of livestock, area under cultivation, and what's not available for agriculture and what is potentially available for future production. That's what has happened in Delta, where their first agricultural plan was recently adopted. The on-the-ground information from this survey helped clearly define the profile of agriculture in the city. Delta is the largest uh, land mass uh, as far as the municipality is concerned in the Lower Mainland. And of our entire land mass, 40% is uh, agricultural in our community. Uh, about $35 million in receipts and uh, 1,500 jobs a year. So it, it is quite an economic generator. While planners in Delta already knew their primary crops included potatoes and other vegetables, the survey also provided other unexpected information that was consistent with other Metro Vancouver cities. The number one crop in terms of acreage is different types of forage grasses. This speaks to um, the importance of the livestock sector, especially the dairy sector in Metro Vancouver, because they're using that land to feed their, their animals. Over two summers, the pair inventoried all the metro municipalities. There's often a lot of land in the ALR that's just automatically not available for agriculture. Between 10 to 15 percent of any local government ALR is covered by road right-of-ways, railways, uh, non-farm uses such as parks or um, sometimes community buildings. Some non-permitted land uses occur, such as illegal fill dumping and truck parking. 
Uh, we have certainly seen this in some of the municipalities we've surveyed and it's marked on our land use inventory so if the local governments choose they could go back and do some bylaw enforcement using our data. Uh, Polygon Zero is golf green. Although it provides a broad range of information, the survey was initiated by the province to help develop an agriculture water demand model. The inventory will give us a good scientific estimate of how much water agriculture uses, both today and in potential future scenarios. What we did is we took a food systems approach when we developed this strategy. And, and in other words, we wanted to look at the whole system. Metro Vancouver is a facilitator between the many engaged agencies. And the data collected in this land inventory contributes to the viability of farming in the Lower Mainland. I think good policy decisions are based on good quality data and a lot of people don't understand how much agriculture that they have in their communities and I think this will help make it more real. The data will be available alongside Metro Vancouver's regional growth strategy which contains land use policies that protect the regional agricultural land base and improve the economic viability of farming. In five years, maybe we do another inventory and we'll know whether we've been successful at protecting agricultural land and we'll know whether we have more actively farmed land or not and how that land is being used. With the average age of BC farmers at 52, there is a need to attract young people to the industry. Some say one of the main barriers is the cost of land. Metro Vancouver's regional food strategy encourages several tactics to do this, such as leasing land and incubator farms, where land, equipment and infrastructure are provided. There are many farm operations in the Fraser Valley and Metro Vancouver. Let's meet two and see how their farm lives compare. Meet farmer Lauren Taves. We farm over 50 acres. He runs Apple Barn Farm in Abbotsford. We grow greenhouse vegetables, berries and apples, three poultry barns and pumpkins. And those are the main things that we grow. We have four tractors, two lawn tractors, two ATVs, five pickup trucks, uh, for the markets as well and uh, also a uh, bobcat with like this thing here why they left this up like this can i go underneath it i don't know now let's visit chris thoreau's farm he runs my urban farm in the strathcona neighborhood of vancouver size wise our space here is about 1800 square feet and our, our actual growing space is a, a little less than 300 square feet we do soil grown sprouts. We do three different types, sunflower, pea and buckwheat. Well, officially, I don't have any farm machinery, uh, even though this is technically a machine. This is our uh, spinner, so we spin the sprouts in here. And the other machine we would use would be a bicycle because we do all our deliveries by bike and by trailer. Technically, his farm doesn't exist. Essentially, what I do is illegal. Um, not because it's a bad thing, but because there's no zoning or business license uh, policies yet in the city for urban farming. We followed each farmer for a day in summer 2011. Lauren started his day with his least favorite task, office work. What I'm doing right now is uh, we're looking to transfer some workers to other farms that may need them for their fall harvest. A provincial program allows farms to hire Mexican workers at reduced rates. He's got several workers living at his farm. We pay ten to fourteen thousand dollars a year. We pay plane tickets to get here. Uh, it's good for, or more than that. Um, if I can transfer someone to another farm, they will pay that plane ticket back. At my urban farm, staffing hasn't been an issue so far. I have people all the time wanting to volunteer. So there's a bit of a trend now with urban farming, and it allows people to get an experience with farming. Um, without having to leave the city. 
I pay 12 bucks an hour, which for agricultural work is not bad. For casual work and relatively easy work, uh, I think that attracts people. And uh, my uh, glowing sense of humor, really. Um, I think that's what keeps people coming, <laughs> coming, <laughs> coming back. At the Apple Barn, Lauren has traded computer mouse for tape measure so that he can deal with a plumbing issue in the petting zoo. I'm going to put an automatic flush system in. I'm just kind of writing down parts and things like that. That was part of my list today. So uh, because you can see here, this was washed this morning. And look at that already. That's how much the bunnies wow. poop. <laughs> Next stop is the emerging corn maze. It's kind of new for us, but it's coming off very nice. The corn is growing really well. This last week that we put the ribbons up because we felt that we should have actually squeezed in the rows a little tighter. And just uh, yep. sending some emails out. Lauren is feeling the double pressure of business and the ripening crops. That's a huge amount of aphids. Question is, is it too late to put on a spray or you just let the mother nature play it out and you lose a portion again? Lauren decides not to spray and that some weeding should be done instead. So here's a note, that's something I'll get the crew to do. This is what I do my rounds. Yeah. Chris took a spin at farming by starting the business while in university. It's a very concentrated crop, so it's very high value and I only need a little, little bit of space. This is year three, uh, the business model is holding up fairly well. Most of the morning is spent processing dozens of flats of sprouts. It's a very monotonous job. We do a lot of repetition. The growing benches must be sanitized. Then still to be done is more seeding, paperwork, and the deliveries. It's a lot to balance sometimes, especially because of the cycling aspect of it. I love that, but uh, it's fatiguing. I've got a two and a half year old son at home. There's so much to do. And while it would be great to have people doing specific things, uh, just financially that's not viable. Overhead costs play a big role in both farms. I, my farm has not been growing more busy because I want it to, it is because I have to. I probably spend around $2.8 million a year as for the checks that we write or to service loans. Food system audits, carbon tax, and safety regulation upgrades increase the operating budget. A small operation could never, ever afford to do that. At Chris's urban farm, there are no industry or government fees or requirements yet. Wendy at the city, she did warn us. She said, you know, be careful what you ask for, because you could get some policies that are essentially pro-urban farming, but introduce a bunch of costs. One cost he doesn't have is rent. I had offered to pay rent because I actually feel a bit more comfortable knowing I'm paying for a service, but it makes it much more financially viable for me. On last year's numbers, we did $21,000 in sales and had about uh, $11,000 in expenses, so about a 50% uh, margin there. Okay, I got some sprouts for you folks here. Chris delivers sprouts to a few Vancouver restaurants, but the bulk sell at farmer's markets. Because I'm dealing directly with the end user of the, of the produce, I'm getting a lot of feedback. It's a very social time as well. The Apple Barn has many sales techniques, including an on-site sales extravaganza each fall. We've adopted a, a sort of a tourism element. He also sells through distributors, his own wholesale operation, and farmers markets. We got into multiple crops, retailing what we're growing to try and battle the lower market returns. Of course, that causes more people hired and more staffing. And next thing you know, instead of me going the tractor and working, I'm running crews. That's actually probably why I don't sleep much right now because I, I am at a bit of a juggernaut. Chris's farm future is not tied to the land. We're working with the city right now to look at policies relating to uh, urban farming and how those need to change. So how those policies change will dictate where this business goes. For Lauren, the farm is the land. Business angles may change, but as a man who grew up on this farm, and now as a dad of seven children here, it is likely that Apple Barn will be feeding the region for decades to come. To update their stories for this season, Lauren says he's planning to expand the corn maze, and Chris is buying an electric bike.
You're watching The Sustainable Region, and today we're connecting the dots in BC's food system. An important link in the local food supply chain is food processing. This can be simple as washing and boxing berries, or complex as making cheese, sausages, or potato chips. It can be done by a dedicated plant, or a co-packer, which does the work on hire for several clients. Food processors preserve the local harvest for use throughout the year and support the viability of the whole system. Many individuals involved in the food system, such as those at farmers markets, would like a larger piece of that pie. We have very few uh, mechanisms for getting food from all those 20,000 small farms through to distribution, through to storage and processing, and then into our grocery stores, into our restaurants, into our schools, into our hospitals. One issue is the limited volume of food that small producers have available for processing. Part of the problem that co-packers today would have is that small businesses don't necessarily bring a consistent and predictable volume of business. And there is certainly cost for setup, cleanups, changeovers, uh, distribution routes as well. Another consideration is the skill set and business model of the food producers. Not all farmers want to step into the kitchen. And one of the things I really like about food growing in general is that it's mostly outdoor work and processing is not. You're generally in a facility, lots of stainless steel, lots of walls, generally not a lot of windows. These operations can require extensive capital outlay, as was discussed among the Metro Vancouver Committee responsible for regional food systems. When it comes to vegetable processing, it is a huge amount of money involved. We're talking probably 50 to 80 million dollars to get started. So who's going to have that kind of money? And there's very low margin in it. It's not like people are reeling in money on vegetables. It's, it's penny, penny margins. Indeed, many long-loved packers and co-ops have closed their doors due to business consolidation and centralization. Only three or four decades ago, we had 26, 26 processors in the Lower Mainland that made something out of our agricultural, pro uh, agricultural production. Today there are about 1,400 food processor businesses in British Columbia, but few are large. The industry is characterized by many smaller operations that produce higher value, niche-based products. Sepp Amsler is an entrepreneur who made a success of hard bite potato chips produced in Maple Ridge. The potatoes are grown within 30 miles from here, just across the river. The lucky part for us is local is in now, so we are ahead of everybody else. This is a true kettle chip, that means we hand rake it batch by batch and we were very careful that the potatoes and the oil ratio is correct. There is financial incentive to get involved. Food processing is worth 7.1 billion in sales in British Columbia more than double the sales of agriculture and aquaculture combined. The small processors, their markets are primarily in the region that they're uh, producing within. I would say no more than 100 miles, simply because of distribution and possibly shelf life concerns. Companies that grow eventually move into exporting, where the sales appeal is Canada's clean image. If you are to survey countries from around the world and their uh, perception of what branded Canada means. There's um, a sense of quality, natural, wholesomeness. There's a sense of very, very good food safety programs. A few producers have captured expanding berry markets by building their own freezer plants, such as Fraser Valley Packers and South Alder Farms. I started as a berry farmer and then it grew to becoming a, a larger berry farm and larger and then we had we did a lot of our marketing and we became uh, self-sufficient in selling all our own berries so we had to build our own uh, packing plant and we also have a freezer operation which is second part of our berry industry where the berries are frozen. Many individuals involved in food processing say the key to success is to add value and apply innovation. The market is dictating I believe uh, to the food processors, the kinds of products that they want to have on their table tonight. What is the market asking of you? Leaders seem to be listening. 
At the farmer's market level, plans are underway to create a shared processing and storage facility in Vancouver. We need the investment in the land, we need investment in the infrastructure, and then everything else is going to happen, it will fall into place. In Chilliwack, federal and provincial funding has helped establish a long-awaited food technology development centre designed to assist companies with product innovation and commercialization. Within 10 years, when we put these things in place, we will see a, a hugely changed food system. I feel very fortunate that I'm working with a, a number of really interested and wise individuals who care so much about the food industry. It's a wonderful time to be involved. We all have too much stuff, but getting rid of it in a sustainable way is tough. Like all that old sports gear or that leftover paint that can't go to the landfill, Metro Vancouver's new We Recycle app turns your iPhone into a reuse and recycling powerhouse. It'll find the nearest place for your stuff to go. Simple, sustainable, everything has its place. We Recycle, now available in the App Store. Today on the Sustainable Region, we're getting a better understanding of how food, such as this nectarine, travels through our regional food system. From the availability of land, to the farmers that nurture it, through to processing. After these steps, even more hands come into play. Distributors and warehousers deliver the food to the marketplace, and brokers and merchandisers determine its pricing and marketing plan. Finally, it's on the store shelf. What will you as a shopper select? Let's find out. Right now we're down at the Vancouver Trading Convention Center at Grocery Showcase West. This is the supermarket for supermarket operators. They're looking for products that might give their store a bit of a differentiation from everybody else. So people are looking to buy things and, and get, them, get them on the shelf for their consumers. It's also a great place for all these small and local food processors and manufacturers to see all of us retailers where they wouldn't normally have the manpower to get out and market the new products. The trade show has many familiar brands, but new for 2012 is BC Producers Row. Retailers are definitely looking for something local and something unique. We have exotic and um, wild mushrooms and we do blends that other companies have not thought of doing. It's a huge cost in the sales of what we do, um, but, it, but we figure if we start driving around and trying to visit every store in the lower mainland of Vancouver, that's a huge cost too and a lot of time spent. Steve Lockhart is a grocery store manager. Did you find everything you were looking for? Local has become important in stores. Consumers are looking for local. In terms of produce department, in July and August, we have up to 350 local products. Local grocery items, however, are more rare on their shelves. Scale of economy and uh, supply and demand, I would say 10, 15, 20 percent of our grocery products are local, i.e. BC or Canadian. Distributors and brokers play a big role in determining which grocery items are available in stores. A smaller distributor, they could work with, you know, three or four farms. Our manufacturers or our own distribution company we have over 2,000 grocery lines. The broker works on the advertising and uh, demos and, and launching the product. Hey Richard it's Steve Cullen from the White Rock store how you doing? We have some really slow selling conventional oils. Certainly price and item are also an issue that retailers you know have to work with. Shelf space is of the premium Essentially, it's like real estate. Just talking to other people here, saying that once we come in, they're having to kick another person off of their shelf space. I think the market for anybody is, is extremely competitive, and it doesn't really matter on the category. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very important for a food producer to differentiate themselves. A lot of the times, farmers aren't the best advertisers and don't know the means and the relationships that they have with retailers to get their product out to market. The trade show included a shopper marketing workshop. The way people actually shop is they're almost on autopilot. They're used to going down certain aisles that they frequently shop. They're used to going to certain products that they usually shop. You've got to really do something to jar their behavior. But there are ways that you can really efficiently talk about your product. And I would say if you start from the very fundamentals, can they clearly really know what the main message is? 
Metro Vancouver area businesses tend to follow that advice. We're rolling out new packaging and featuring a lot of the local aspects of outdoor lifestyle that, that we believe are really important. We used to have our label on the top, which is great exposure, but it hides the product. So we're coming out probably in two weeks, we'll get it with a corner label. We're finding that more and more people are wanting to know where their food comes from. So when we meet with them both at the stores or here at the shows or at the farmers markets, we just have to tell our story. As these local marketplace newcomers share their stories and knowledge, the benefits accrue throughout the regional food system. Value chains are created that benefit everyone in the region. Clearly shoppers have an interest in local food and it's rippling innovations through the entire food system in products, processing and farming scenarios. Some wonder if the trendiness in local food will fade. It may, but the gains will have been made throughout the entire food system. Tell us what you thought of today's show at sustainableregion at metrovancouver.org and see more videos at metrovancouver.org slash videos. For Metro Vancouver's The Sustainable Region, I'm Vanessa Timmer. Thanks for watching.